ever since I was like five years old. Uh, my, uh, I was lucky enough that my dad, uh, for work in the like early, uh, you know, eighties had somehow a lot, what we, they would consider a laptop at that time was really an entire suitcase. Uh, and I got to mess around with some programs and I, I've kind of always been fascinated with tech. My grandfather was an electrician. He made me tinker with like radios and like TVs and like anything that had a circuit board. Uh, and so I just, you know, I, I like it. And then, um, you know, started getting into, you know, got into the internet really early on. And that was, uh, you, know, I, you know, I really enjoyed, I kind of like loved the idea of the internet and like, you know, that you could find everything and that like, it was this is cool thing that, you know, portal into the world. Right. And, uh, um, and that was, you know, that, that fascinated me, but, um, I think, you know, that was kind of like in technology. So I went to study, you know, I went to, uh, you know, I, I kind of always studied kind of technology and it was programming in high school and, um, I got to college and that's where I kind of found out data, um, which was kind of interesting because I kind of like defined my entire career after that. My first internship was at a BI consulting firm. I had no idea what that was. And uh, the first call I went on with a consultant, I was like supposed to be his like, you know, coffee boy helper or whatever, you know, junior intern guy. And uh, I go to the first meeting with him and he's like, so this is back in the day for anybody who's been in the BI space. So this is a, uh, I don't know if you remember Crystal Reports. It's like super old technology, like how you kind of like build some it. And so he's like, sits down there and he's like, I'm going to tell you something about your business that you don't know that's brave and you know ballsy to say that like to a process you know person i'm gonna tell you something about grab some data grab some blah blah like make some reportings like yeah you see the sales here and the blah blah, blah. and like and the guy's like oh yeah okay like this is like a like an insight onto that and like my entire brain was blown on that and i was like wow like this guy just grabbed some data from this prospect and was like i'm gonna teach you something you don't know about your own business and i was like this is possible and that kind of led me down the path. I actually returned from that internship. I was going to be a mechanical engineer, returned from that internship, changed my entire major to like information systems and data analytics. And then did like undergrad, grad school and worked in every single point in my career after that was in that space. So a bit of a change up after that one. I could see yeah, how that one. I was just like, I loved it. I was just like, I, I think it's such an amazing thing that we can grab signals from the world. Mm and make decisions or understand it better at scale with computers. And I was like, that's fascinating to me. That's, yeah, that's so cool. Now tell me, how did it evolve from being at Microsoft to what you're doing now with Algorithmia? Yeah, so uh, kind of in two parts. First, I, I met my co-founder in, in college. So we went to Carnegie Mellon together. We did undergrad together. So he, I met him there. And we've been friends forever. And he went on to do his PhD in AI uh, at uh, USC. I stayed at Carnegie Mellon in May and, um, and did my master's there in analytics, in advanced analytics. And um, when I went to Microsoft, I was working really on the BI stack. So Excel as the visualization layer, um, for those of you who are super, you know, understand that, you know, that ended up having kind of like an in-memory engine data model that was for analytics that ended up turning into Power BI as a new visualization layer, SQL Server analysis services, the data warehouse services. So these are kind of like that stack. So if you think about BI as historical looking, right? So like how we look back and say, hey, how do we explain, you know, we have data from the past and we can kind of explain it. So we have a hypothesis, this happened because of blah and we can go prove it with some data. One of the things that was happening was that more and more we're moving towards predictive analytics, which is okay, we've actually trying to predict kind of like what it's going to look like in the future. And we actually started building features for these products that were, you know, baby machine learning to a certain degree, right? Like advanced heuristics. So a good example of this is one of the features that I worked on in design was uh, automatic pivot tables. So if you go in Excel and you select a table and it automatically generates a pivot table, like that actually is a combination of a small data model and some heuristics that looks at the data, looks at the title, looks at the kind of density, and then suggests what a pivot table might look like in that way. And that code actually came in from Microsoft Research. So we had this research 
it's a, it's a, it's a stretch to call it a mail code by today standards, but it was like kind of like basically, you know, like it had some regressions and had blah blah. And so, and then yeah, back in the day, it was edge. It was on yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, and so, cutting edge. Yeah, so they give you this, and Microsoft is like, okay, so here you go. You just put it in the product, and you're like, wait, Excel goes out to a billion people. Like, you don't just grab like a you know script from a researcher and like put it into a product. So that was kind of like the first time. I kind of like landed on this like productionized problem, which is very different from where we are today. But like this, this idea that you need to grab something that was written as a research project or script MATLAB potentially or something. And then it needs to be hardened to a piece of software that, you know, goes out to a billion people that you have no access to. Right. And, exactly. um, and this no type pressure. of, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And so this was interesting because for years, Kenny, my co-founder, had been kind of coming to me and coming with this idea and saying, hey, we, you know, the, he used to say this thing, which I thought was hilarious, but also now very true. He's like, the future is already invented. It's stuck in an academic paper, right? And, and I was like, and, and, and I always kind of was like, okay, this is, he's a very smart human being. And he was like, I always kind of was like, okay, well, I get it. But he's like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, we have these models, we have these AI, we've, we're moving forward, NLP, we've been moving forward, um, you know, ways of doing image recognition. Nobody has a way of consuming. Like, application developers need to be able to consume this so that we can actually use this technology. So that's what I mean by it's stuck. And like, the entire, I would, I, I'm gonna argue that I actually didn't get it for a long time. And then when I saw that situation happen at Microsoft, I was like, shit, that's exactly what he meant. Like, and I was like, okay, I'm in, let's go solve this. Oh, cool. So how long ago did you guys start Algorithm? So we started in 2014. Okay. So you've been around for a bit and you've seen the landscape change quite a bit. I mean, it's just moving at a pace that's really exciting, right? I mean, I think when we started, you know, it was really about grabbing whatever kind of, I mean, it's literally, it was about grabbing kind of like, state-of-the-art models that were published by academics on GitHub and just rolling those into services and making them available so people could do like sentiment analysis as a service or, you know, image recognition as a service. Really, really basic, like for, you know, basic, basic stuff to like roll into apps. And now we're in a world where it's, you know, most companies are hiring data scientists, machine learning engineers to go build very specific stuff to their world with their data sets and get to, you know, really moving the business forward, right? I, I, I think nobody, um, you know, it, it's interesting because the stats are, are staggering on the failure rate. So it's like something like 85% of machine learning projects don't make it out, which is really, really high. Um, the flip side of that is that the 15% that do make it out have such an insane impact on the business that it's like, okay, this is, this is worth, this is a problem we're focusing on because, and, and you know, we see you don't really have to go farther than a company like Amazon, right? Where you look at what they're, forget about AWS in itself, but like Amazon as an organization on the market side, like everything's powered by ML, right? Their pricing, their ads, their supply chain, their, you know, their reach out, their customer service. I mean, like that's why like the competitive advantage that they're getting from applying you know, mass scale optimization to every single one of their business processes using machine learning technology is huge. You know, amazing. Um, and 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 that's within reach for everybody. And it really is, right? It's just you have to focus on which kind of goes back to this. You have to focus on what what you're going to be building and what you're going to be buying and what is important about you know that. Yeah. So great segue into what you're going to be building and what you're going to be buying. I know you guys have, you put out a, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's like a paper or a poster. I'm putting the link to it in the chat. It, and I think people can just download this um, directly from. Yeah. From yeah. So you can go to our, uh, let me, yeah. Do you put, oh, perfect. You posted it there. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, yeah. So, so here's, here's, here's the core, the, the, the gist of it. Like, look, I'm, um, I'm a tech guy. I'm a technologist. I love building. Like I have to hold myself back from building absolutely everywhere. I'm sure everybody on this call is feeling the exact same way. Like it's, 
you just love you know the result of like grabbing tech and piecing it together and getting to a point where you're like oh my god i did that and like that endorphin rush is like everything like i get it i get it the problem that becomes really when like what you're trying to do is get to an outcome right the outcome is did you apply machine learning to that business process so you got the result and did it work and when you look at and if you focus on that and say okay look my mission isn't to build a machine learning platform my mission is not to train a model even. My mission is not to even like piece together to me out. My mission is to move the needle for my business, right? And so when you think about it that way, right, that's how you have to focus kind of like the, the, the workflow and what you want to do now. Okay. So now you're saying, okay, my focus is to move the needle for the business. Where can I add the most value, right? As a, as a, as a, as a, as a human inside this organization, whether I'm either a data scientist, or the machine learning engineer, or the DevOps engineer, right? Like, where can I add the most value? Well, the truth is, is I can add the most value by accelerating anything I can do to get to that result. And the way to get to acceleration is to focus on the thing I'm really, really good at, right? The one thing. So if I'm a data scientist, then like building models, figuring out data, you know, kind of like getting the right data, like, you know, working with hyperparameters, like getting to the result, like that's what you're, that's what you should be focused. That's where you bring it. If you're kind of like a machine learning engineer, your focus is on making sure that the repetition and the, the scale out of this can work as quickly and as best as possible. And if you're the application, you want to be focused on consuming it so that you can apply it to, you know, the business process. So you have to really ask yourself a question, is building a platform for any of these steps the value add? If the answer is yes, right? Then, you know, hey, go in, right? Like go in, there's, you know, like that, that's, you know, like, but, you know, the problem comes when you, it's not just about building, right? Because getting, I, I bet, I'm just gonna take a wild guess that every single person in this chat has trained a model at one point and deployed it with an API and a flask app. That's fine. You know, that, you know, like that's not a, it's, this is not a, it's not rocket science, right? It, it's fairly easy to do. Yeah. We actually, we talked with, uh, and I reference this talk a lot, um, Sarab, who talked to us about putting an open source pipeline together. And he was saying, you know, it's fairly trivial when you put all these pieces together, but the real hard part comes in when you're starting to talk with security and you're saying who's in control of the patches of this whole thing who's gonna work on the updates who's gonna work on everything that is behind this trivial piece of frankenstein pipeline so i think that's totally. kind of what you're hinting at yeah i mean it, it, and that that's kind of what it is so so you know like i think the first question so i think the first question you need to answer is is this the place where I'm adding the most value? Because then there's math to be done. Even on top. like even if the answer is yes, you still need to go because you don't even need to do this calculation if you know if that's not where you're adding the most value. Like if you're sitting there being like piecing together, you know, Kubeflow with an open source tool, another tool with getting a Kubernetes cluster up and running versus you know putting models and containers and pushing them to a flask app like if that is not where you're bringing value like you shouldn't even be having this conversation or the math right like immediately you can say that's not where i bring value right like if you're sitting there being like my value is training models then that's what you should be focused on um now let's say that for xyz reason you're in an organization where you really think you have to build out the platform and we've seen this um, you know, we've talked to multiple companies, including, you know, the Ubers, the Twitters, you know, they built out really complex internal ML platforms. And the one constant that you see there is that the investment gets bigger and bigger every year, right? So if you go back and you look at the history of Michelangelo a little bit at Uber, um, it was TensorFlow only right? For a bit. And they were like, okay, yeah, if you're going to do anything in ML, you're going to use it in TensorFlow and you're going to build blah, blah, blah. Well, happens to be that 18 months later, that's not acceptable anymore. Like you need to go add this, you need to go add that. And that's fine. But like the journey, like build is a journey. It's not a decision that you make. At one point in time, you can make a decision, but like most people are completely ignoring 
Uh, so I totally agree with, sorry, I remember, forgot the name of the person you said, but like, I totally agree with like the, the assessment there, which is, you know, you make a decision at one point in time of like, okay, if I build it, I'm going to get to this. But then like the part that's ignored is, does this evolve? Is this multiple use cases? Is this going to actually be reusable? Because even in the world of, you know, the use case we see the most is there's a recipe. Hey, when you want to productionize a model, follow this recipe go containerize it this way, go call this person to go do this, this, blah, blah, like, and get, get an API and running. What happens when you have hundreds of these models running? How do you control them? How do you observe what's going on there? How do you start keeping track of what's being done across the organization? Like the knowledge sharing that is built into this gets lost. And so now you're like, oh, well, we'll go build that. Let's go build a catalog for them. Let's go build versioning for them. Let's go build more utility. Let's go build is an expensive proposition because A, time, where potentially it's not the time that you're spending on the most valuable thing that you should be doing, you know, which is, and B, um, you know, how do you, you know, like, 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 like there's risk, like you might get there or not, you might get, you know, the rug pulled from under you, from your, you know, your business. Hey, we don't want to invest anymore. I need 40 engineers to build a platform and maintain it for the next five years. Is that going to be a yes? <laughs> yeah, it reminds me too. This is such a great point. It's a journey and it's constantly evolving because when we talk to um, Carlos from down in, he's in Argentina doing stuff with uh, Mercado Libre and they're yeah. building, they built their own and he's like the team that does that. But <laughs> at one point he said, you know, yeah, you can use any language you want on our, uh, with our infrastructure, as long as it's Python. Right. <laughs> right. It's, there's no, they didn't want to bring in the support for another one or whatever. It's. Uh... <laughs> and look how fast the space is moving. So, I mean, I think Python's a, it's a fair bet, I would argue. Like, as a Pythonista, you know, I'm biased. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's a fair bet. But the, the, the reality here is, there's also a pretty big split between kind of smaller or I would say kind of like younger companies. So a Mercado Libre, big company right now, but from a tech perspective, kind of like, you know, there's a kind of new era, Twitter, Uber, you know, like it's almost like ML is born yeah. with the company, yeah. right? Like, like, and so they were kind of like, okay, well, we're going to start doing this this way. And if you want to work on this, you have to do it this way. And that works to a degree, fast forward, you know, you look at an insurance company or you look at a media company or you look at a financial services company who's been doing ML for years, in some cases, decades, depending on how you define ML. Um, and they've been using tools across the board, but also the size of the company. So if you go and you like point out to like as a, as a you know, a large organization, so like pick, you know, your favorite bank, you know, you're going to have teams that were using H2O, teams that you're using Domino, teams that are using, uh, you know, uh, you know, like raw Jupyter notebooks, they're going to have some in-house thing, they're going to be hiring some PhDs that are really, really specific to a certain quant world where they're like, oh, we write stuff in MATLAB or we write stuff in, in, in R and there's just no way you're going to force an organization that size into so we could do any language as, as long as it's python and so by definition now an mlops platform that can like run all these workloads in a consistent way is has to be expansive right and it has to be continuously evolving completely and just a, a bit of uh tangent real fast before you jump into all of the rest because i know you have some cool infographics on yeah. all the stuff you need to you need to keep in mind when you're going through the build process but i'm wondering what you've been seeing for those companies that you're talking about when they're so dispersed and there's no standardization at all do they eventually bring in standardization or do you see it like they just kind of cut out a piece of the pie and say, all right, we're going to start standardizing over here and then the rest do whatever you want. So, so you see a little bit of both. My, my, I have a, I have a, I have a personal bias that might not be the best recommendation 
given the fact that I'm a vendor either, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty big on the, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Like I kind of, as a, as a software principle, <laughs> right? Like, like in, in general, right? Say so there's plenty of new use cases. So, so when we go in and I start talking about, um, you know, where we should be doing, um, you know, how we should be doing this, I, I generally focus on saying, what are the new use cases that you're not getting to because they don't fit? What are the new use cases? You know, so obviously you can focus on a problem. You know, we see this a ton, which is we have this model. We want to get into production. The production system's falling apart. We can't audit it. We can't govern it. Our IT team won't let it go because of security reasons. So like, that's a problem. That's not a, it's working, right? So, so you can focus on those. Um, but if it's something that's like running in production and up and running and it's giving you the good results, like, again, is there value in you spending your time and reinventing the wheel there for something that's working? And I would say, no, like, that's not where your best value is. What you should be focused on is what are the next 10 use cases that could be, cause there's, you know, infinite use cases at an organization that where ML can be applied. And so then you come to the question of, okay. We have this thing working, great. Can we shove the next one in there? That's a question that you can ask yourself. Can we shove the next 10 in there? What's gonna happen there? Or are we already realizing that the next 10 are not gonna fit into that paradigm? Let's let this one run. Let's go build this other thing. And then if now it's like a management problem that we have to deal with two systems or it's a pain in the ass or something like that, now you actually have a problem that's worth addressing to go the other way. So I'm pretty practical about this. As I said, like it's not probably the you know, my sales team would probably not be super happy with me saying that, but, but uh, I, I do think it's like, you know, the best for the customer is to understand where they can be applying the best value of their resources. And I, in a lot of cases, I do think like the best value is to go buy something that allows them to accelerate. It allows them to get to production quicker. It allows them to standardize. It allows them to use their very expensive, uh, you know, team to apply to new use cases. I mean, why would you be replacing something that's already running? Like if it works again, the question is if it works, there's a lot of like, well, it's running. And like, that's not what I said. <laughs> like running is very different, right? Like, are you still, are you complying with the things you need? Like, do you have the security you comply? Can you upgrade? Can you get to the next model? Because these are all things where I would argue that that system's broken, but. Uh, these are great points to take into account. Now, do you have on hand, do you have this infograph, the journey? Yes. The yeah. Let me, let me, let me pop that up here. So, and I'll kind of like, um, talk about it here. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. You should have sharing privileges. Great. Thank you. You're worth it. I told you, Diego, I told you at the beginning, you're worth an intro. Yeah, I, I, I need, I need, I need these kind of affirmations every morning. <laughs> I'm going to call you up. Yeah, don't worry. I'm free. <laughs> All right, cool. We see your screen. So Thanks. now. Um, so real quick, and I think most of you here know this, but you know, the way that we look at it from this kind of like machine learning life cycle is like, you have a whole bunch of stuff that needs to happen in training. And there's a whole bunch of ops work and like experiment tracking and like, there's a whole world of things that happen in the world of ML development. We're getting to a serialized model is the best way that I think about it. I don't really talk about that much. Just how are we specialize in? Like what we specialize is in everything that happens after that. And how do you tie that cycle into it? And so when we talk about ML ops or model, you know, operations and management, we really think about, okay, I grabbed a serialized model. How do I connect it to the data that I'm going to do inference on? How do I register those pipelines into a catalog that is searchable and usable? How do I pipeline those models into each other? How do I manage that workflow? Um, how do I scale on infrastructure? How do I monitor, report, audit, govern over those things in a, in a, in a good way? So that's kind of what we think about. And again, what, uh, where we come in is we, we attach ourselves to the customer application. So we, we believe in this world where multiple ML development environments will connect into this system. So we're very integration focused around that. So um, this is kind of what we talk about the journey of, of this. So, so you've, you've, you've built your model and, and this is, is, it's busy, but I'll walk you through it. You know, so you've built your model or multiple models and you're an organization. And like the reality is, is that 
there could be all sorts of training paradigms around around this journey, right? Where you're saying, okay, maybe I I I, I built a model on data robot, maybe I have a computer vision model that I've been used OpenCV with. Maybe I have some Spark workflows that you know are spitting out an ML flow file. Maybe I am using driverless AI on H2O. Maybe I'm, you know, the tried and true Jupyter notebook jockey that's just kind of like, you know, working everything in open source tool. The reality is, is that all of those at some point are going to produce a serialized model in a point in time where it's going to be a snapshot of the results that you will now want to run that model against the production application. If you do not run that model against the production application, you that there's no value in any work you've done. So even if you're a data scientist who's focusing on where you're bringing the most value, remember that you are tied to the fact that this needs to go into production or you've produced no value. I'm not trying to be mean, it's just the reality. Otherwise it's just science. Yeah, bring us the honest truth, come on now. Yeah, <laughs> right, and so, and so once you get that model, you start thinking about, okay, okay, what are the things that I want need to take care of? Well, you know, I need to be able to version the model, right? Um, super important. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, this, this has multiple levels. Of it. I need to be able to potentially, you know, publish that model to a model library so other people find it that they might want to use it because, you know, you want to try to try to be as reusable as possible in an organization especially if you've already trained things which are on, on customer data or specific, specific data sources, I, I would argue, especially, specifically extractors of it, you know, when you're thinking about kind of like document extractors and just kind of like uh, different kinds of extractors, and it, like those are usually reusable inside an organization because you're working on kind of the same data and slightly different slices. So being able to provide a model library is, uh, is, is, is important so for reusability. So, okay, do you have that? Can you build that around that? You know, so it's, uh, you know, when you talk about model pipeline, models don't live in vacuums, right? So there's usually, you know, in some cases you're building ensembles, right? Where you have multiple classifiers kind of like, you know, like built on top of each other. Hmm. In other cases, uh, you know, you're just trying to do pre-processing model post-processing functions, but they live in pipelines and you need to think about how is this going to get piped and how it's going to live and can I control those pieces? Um, you want to manage the code in the same way you manage the, the model versions, right? All your inference code should be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I want to keep track of it. I want to see what the changes are. And I want to be able to go reuse like previous versions if for some reason something gets lost. So really, so, you know, source code management becomes important. Reflecting things through an API, right? How do we actually get to an API and how do we get to, uh, you know, something that can be consumed across the world? And then I need to be able to connect it to data sources. So this comes, becomes, you know, a really core piece of the things I need to solve on my journey to get something into production. So then now when we look at these kind of core things that we need to do, right? Now imagine we need to do that for tons of frameworks and libraries, tons of languages, tons of processing dependencies, and tons of data connections that we might need to do. So your matrix of build out has just become quite big, right? So if you think about like, I need to solve this, and now I need to solve it for all these different Things. So you have a, multi a matrix multiplication of kind of variability of things that I need to actually go build out and attend to upgrade and work with like moving forward. Wow. Yeah. That and so then we go into point. the, uh, sorry. That's just such a good point. Yeah. To keep in mind. So then we go into the operation side of things, right? Which is, okay, let's say I figure this out. And now I can, you know, I can grab my data robot model and, you know, mat, you know, model version it, deploy it as an API, run it. I can actually combine my data robot model with what I built in Jupyter Notebooks with my kind of like Spark workflow and whatever. Um, now we think about it, okay, well, how do we do this at speed, right? Like in a, app, in a, in a prod world, it better not rely on a person doing clicks. Right, so now we start thinking about how do we integrate this into the CI/CD pipeline. So now you have an integration point of okay, can I trigger the system programmatically to go do all of these steps, auto containerization, register the library, blah blah, in an automatic fashion, right? Because what I want, what I really want to do is I want to run a train, a training thing. I want to see when I get the good results. When there's a good result, I want to publish that model into production automatically. And then test it. Obviously, there's tests all around the way, but I 
that process should be automated, right? There shouldn't be relied on a person, especially in certain things like, like, you know, like some models get trained, you know, every couple of minutes, right? And, and, and you're updating them constantly and uh, especially kind of like online behavior ones. And so you want to be able to do that. And then you want to be able to integrate it into those applications, which are, you know, visualizations, they're, you know, they're going to be in some cases, some cases they're actually just other infrastructure uh, applications. So you have to start thinking about the integration points, how are you going to do monitoring and alerting at every single, what, when something goes wrong, I ran out of machines to start scaling the, you know, the, the model is going in the wrong direction. You know, it's starting to fail. I'm getting errors. The application's not working. This is all things that you need to build for a production environment uh, around that. So this is kind of like table stakes of getting stuff up and running. So then you go move and say, okay, well, where am I running this? And so you might say, well, you know, our organization's only AWS. Great. You might say our organization's only on-prem. Okay. Now that opens a whole variety of problems that you might have, which is hardware, consistency, like all sorts of that. But the reality is that more and more companies, um, especially in a world where data provincey becomes really important. So like larger companies where they need to actually have, they have like multi-cloud strategies. Hey, we need to run in AWS. We do need to run in Azure. We potentially still need to run on-prem. Okay, are you gonna rebuild all of this for each one of those infrastructures? And even if you use their managed service, let's say, right? Like you say to make on AWS or Azure ML, like those pipelines and models are not gonna translate. So you're still now another matrix multiplication of, you know, what you need to build versus trying to be consistent. So you better start thinking about when you're building, am I going to be able to be able to build something that's going to be consistently transferable between the different providers and infrastructure providers? And, you know, and am I going to be able to actually have consistency around the deployment technology and the containerization and stuff like that? And, I think one of the exciting technologies in the world is, you know, this idea of Kubernetes and that kind of being like a consistent layer. But for any of you who've actually worked with this in de any depth, like AWS is EKS, uh, you know, AKS and Azure and GKS at uh, Azure, they're not consistent. Like they use different network profiles. They like, like when you start really getting into like true production ML, like the schedulers work differently, the networking works differently. Like, they don't translate one-to-one -one automatically, even though that's the general promise. And so you end up having these problems there. And so, again, this is like a question of, do I want to deal with these problems or, you know, by building it myself, or do you want somebody else to deal with them for me? And again, you have to make that personal decision. And then you get down to the kind of like really nitty gritty of production, especially in ML, where we start talking about governance and security. Like, can I guarantee the data security? And they, uh, can I guarantee the network security? Can I guarantee the model security? Am I actually imp applying the InfoSec policy from my organization to my ML workloads? One of my favorite things around, not favorite, but like just kind of one to illustrate it. Think about the last time you went into requirements.txt for Python and you just downloaded a whole bunch of libraries from, uh, you know, from Pippin, you know, like from PyPy and you deployed that to a production environment. Did you do any security checks on any of those dependencies? Those are attack vectors, yeah, right? Exactly. For an organization. Like you just exposed your entire organization to attack vectors because you brought in dependencies that you actually don't know what's in them. And so this is, again, when we start thinking about how we're gonna apply ML to every single workflow and process, where it becomes super important to understand that like it's code we're building code, we're building software, and we should start applying the like regulations and like kind of like compliance that we've built for our normal software development life cycle into that. And then the flip side of that, which is kind of governance, which is around, hey, am I just doing all the right things from a permissioning perspective? So then on financial services, can I call out to an explainability uh, aspect of the organization? Can I, you know, can I, can I package up all the audit trails for a regulator, right? So, so these are kind of like more maybe industry specific, like maybe you're working in advertising and you're never kind of thinking like, well, there's never gonna be a situation where a regulator is gonna show up and I'm gonna have to like show them every single inference I made and why I made that. That's fine. 
But in financial services, you absolutely have to do that. In life sciences, you absolutely have to do that. In insurance, you absolutely have to do that. So how, are you going to go build all of that architecture into your system as part of this? Or is that not really where you're bringing value? Wow. So there's just so much involved in this. And I knew it was a lot. But this, you know, piece by piece, unit by unit breakdown is so helpful to see. And obviously, it's not just one person that is going to be doing this whole thing. So you have to think about how many other resources, how many other teams are you going to have to like sell this vision to? Wow. That's good stuff. That like uh, Corey saying in the chat, lots of good nuggets here. Lots of. <laughs> I, sorry, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing the chat. So you're gonna have to read it to me. Cause I'm just, I don't have the, the screen here. So I'd, if, I'm not answering questions in the chat is just because I'm, I'm not seeing it, but I'd love to answer them. No worries. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, throw them up because I, I can relay them to Diego. So, all right. What else you got for us? What, well, what comes next? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so think about, so, so now, now let's look at the journey. So this is to get the first thing up and running. This is just the appetizer? Yeah, no, but just think about it, right? So like, this is what you need to think about your production system, your true, true production system to just start. Now, start thinking about when you need to, like, so one of the big things that everybody misses is, how complicated or difficult it is to upgrade components, right? So let's say you, you built a system. Let's just say you built, uh, you know, you built your system. You're probably going to use, we use Kubernetes as well. So you build your system where you have your Kubernetes kind of baseline. You have your containerization baseline. I'm assuming you're using Docker. Um, you have your baseline frameworks, TensorFlow, Ballbot. You have your baseline libraries around kind of provisioning APIs and building that now. What happens when, well, first of all, I mean, the, the easiest, what happens when a zero day shows up in any of those components? So you now you need to scramble to like go upgrade that, that component. So there's an upgrade cost. But now in general, just think about how fast the libraries and frameworks are advancing, right? Like, are you gonna have a team dedicated to like when PyTorch, you know, 3.0 comes out, like, you're going to be on it and to like upgrade everything and test everything and get it up and running. And you're going to do the same thing with your scikit-learn libraries and the latest data robot and the latest stage maker and stuff like that. That's a cost that you need to plan for inside your build organization, because it's not just, you know, it, it's almost like a, it's a misnomer, right? It should be like build and maintain versus buy. Like it's almost like the build by itself is just a, like the build is, I would argue maybe 25% of the cost, and maintain is the other, you know, like, uh, you know, 75% of the cost. Yeah. And I think that's what most people, they're, why they're very jaded when they look at this. Maybe they're seeing half of this, what you're seeing. They're kind of factoring that in and they go, okay, I could do that. And later you have no notion of what needs to come after the fact and how much you need to maintain it and how big of a team you need to be maintaining all of this. Yeah, the, the, the teams that I've seen, I, I, I've, the only successful teams that I've seen in terms of building long-term kind of production infrastructure uh, over time is a 10, 10 engineers dedicated to the project. Like that's the usual unit that I've seen. Like the companies that have been, what I would argue, successful and successful is really depends on them because they will say, well, we're good enough for now. But, you know, like I'll give you a good example. Like the ML team at, Twitter is like a hundred people. Yeah. And a ton of those are dedicated to infrastructure. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I mean, again, you know, they, you know, some could argue they run the information of the world. Uh, and so, you know, I get it, but, but, you know, like, so, but honestly in organizations where we've seen like ML platform teams, like the successful ones have been really on the, like, you know, at least 10 people. So then the question is, are you going to get budget from your organization for 10 headcount? Let's, you know, call it hundred thousand euros a year. Right. Uh, I like that you, you know. quoted in euros. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. You know, I'm, 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 I'm speaking to the audience here, uh, you know, and, uh, 
and are you going to get that, right? So are you going to be spending on just salary, right? About a million, you know, a year where you could actually be using those same 10 people. It's not that those 10 people wouldn't have a job, right? Because that's the, another misnomer. No, you're going to actually be driving the business versus having a platform. And like, no, this is really like, hey, look, I can point to the revenue we generated. I can point to the savings. I can point to the risk we reduced. Um, which is kind of where most companies should really be specializing. You know, I, I, I talk about it our way again, obviously, you know, there's a bias here because I am a vendor, but what I'm saying is like, we've decided that our value add is to build this. Like that's our value add, and, and we've dedicated all our resources just to build this kind of architecture, staying on top of every single framework, updating components. We just do this. Like we don't do anything else other than this. And it's a whole team doing it. And so the question here is, are you going to have that yourself or, you know, or that? And, and one of the biggest problems that I think people come up is that they think they're just because you buy a platform, you need to have lack of flexibility. Right. And, and I'd argue that look at the world of software development, right. Where, and look at your stack, forget about ML, go to your company, open up, look at your stack. You got GitHub, you got probably Jenkins or Travis or Circle CI. You got whatever your preferred ID is. You got your, you know, kind of testing modules. You have your production modules. Much Did you not have choice there? Those are yeah. all platforms that you've bought. Those are all products that you're using, right? And so it's a little bit of a misnomer that you need to, you know, that you can't sit. Like the reality is just which ones are the ones that are flexible? which are the ones that allow you to integrate into your work workflow and give you kind of like a choice first and which are the ones that actually kind of take away the stuff that you want to do. But like, again, go look at your software development life cycle today. And what you'll realize is that you've already picked vendors and platforms at every single stage to help you with a specific piece of it. And you've pieced it together. And that's essentially kind of like where we come in and say, look, that's how we position ourselves as a company, but also how you should think about it. Best in class, for every single piece, you're not going to get an end-to-end -end platform. That is actually true. You're not going to get an end-to-end -end platform that does everything from, in my opinion, from data prep all the way to publishing a model. Like there's a, you know, and it, that didn't happen in the BI world either. And so like there's multiple examples of this, but that's kind of where, you know, I would say like, so for each one of the pieces, you can actually select the platform. There's plenty of fully fledged kind of like a data science, the model building platforms, those workbenches, they're really good. Like you can absolutely go use one and get a lot, a lot of value at it. So you don't have to be dealing with experiment tracking and hyperparameter optimization. And like, I mean, why would you go build that? Completely. Yeah. And something else that Corey's mentioned in the chat is not only do you have the um, support for the platform, but then the support for the people who are using the platform on these teams, right? Like there, right. that's such a good point, Corey. Thanks for pointing that, is, that out. That is a great point. I, uh, I am going to steal that point, Corey. Thank you. <laughs> that is absolutely true. I didn't even think about it. He'll send you the bill later. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you his email. <laughs> so that, that's something that is, you know, the, the teams that you need to be that, that are working on all of this, they have to have so many moving parts and that is, so intense when you look at it and then also you know the monitoring side when you're monitoring all of this these platforms that are out and how model monitoring is so much different than just regular monitoring for software right yeah. so there's so many different moving parts and i knew that the people that were like building this stuff were like superhumans and they were doing crazy things but now it's just you've you've laid it out in such a clear way to me that it makes it well it makes me hold them in a much higher regard and it is very understandable why you would want to where you're trying to say all right we're adding our value here now just uh quick i know we got 10 minutes left so if anyone wants to jump in and throw any questions in the chat feel free i've got a few questions for you about best practices that you've seen over the years because you've been doing this for you're a veteran in the field we could say uh and what are some best practices that you feel like you could share with us 
So a, a lot of, a lot, so the, the kind of like the core, core one of it is uh, that we miss out all the time on like as a, as engineers is start from the end result. So, so we see a lot of like people who started like, okay, I'm going to grab this data. I'm going to build a model. And I'm like, I'm going to see if something works. And we're not really thinking about where this ends up. And so from a best practices perspective, you know, I, um, there's this really interesting concept. I didn't come up with it. So this, this, this guy called Ian Xiao came up with it, which is called the uh, minimal justifiable improvement. So think of it as an MVP for ML, which is what is the minimal justifiable improvement to a process, you know, move the needle on some metric where going into the journey of finding the data, training the data, building the model, deploying the model, running it, like makes sense, right? So if that whole thing is gonna cost me a million dollars, a twenty thousand dollar improvement is not worth it, right? And so I really like that concept. He he wrote a, a blog post called "ML is Boring," uh, which is where he kind of justifies that. I think it's a fantastic framework where it's start from the improvement to the business, then break it out into business impact technology, then start measuring out. Okay, what is it going to take from technology perspective to kind of go back up and build that? And I think that's one of the the most interesting. And, and the reason why I think this is so interesting is because it totally is how ML should be done. Let's think about what we're doing, right? We're optimizing and automating business processes at large scale. And so why would we not start with the result and work backwards? Uh, and, and it's very, uh, and I tell that to every kind of executive that I talk to, which is stop thinking about the beeps and boops of the technology and really figure out what we're doing here because then we'll figure out the technology that fits. Um, so that's kind of one of the, probably the biggest insights I would argue uh, around that. And that blog post, just again, in case we missed it, it was it's called cool. ML is boring. Um, but I also have a, I'll, I'll, if, uh, I'll, I'll send you, a, I don't have it right now. I'll send you a link and then you can redistribute cool. it. Yeah, cool. It, it was, was it from Ian Xiao? Ian Xiao, X-I-A-O. Yeah, I got it right here. Cool. Um, let's put that in the chat for everybody to see. So the next thing I wanted to ask about is, can you just break down what Algorithmia does real fast? Cause I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of people that want to know. Yeah. So, so we're, you know, we kind of, what we talk about is what we do is we're an ML operations and management platform. What we'll do is we deploy the models, we run the inference, and then we manage the life cycle in production. And so what that means is once you get from a serialized model, you gets deployed into the algorithmia platform. We auto containerize it. We auto generate on CPUs as well as GPUs. We auto, uh, you know, kind of generate the APIs for it, documentation, allow you to do pipelining in between them, register them on a registry, and then run those at scale with monitoring and reporting and kind of like all the components. And it's all engaged automatically from a Git push. Right. So if you think about kind of like that GitOps uh, workflow. And so we have two versions of the product. One, which is online, which I, uh, I'll, I'll put an offer out here, which is if you go to algorithmia.com, you can sign up and play with it. Um, if you send me feedback about what you do like and what you don't like with your address, I'll send you one of these t-shirts. Oh, uh, there we go. I was so, going to ask you about that t-shirt. Yeah. So um, just your size and some feedback. Honest feedback is what I want. You know, hey, this is why it worked for me. This is why it didn't work for me uh, and stuff like that. So I just need to send that to me. My email is diego at algorithmia.com. And um, yeah, and you can try that. And this has a SaaS product, pay as you go. It, although when you sign up, it's free, you can test it out. If you move forward, um, if you're in a large enterprise, we also have a, a version of our product that runs entirely behind your firewall. So we can actually just run the entire platform inside your systems on AWS, Azure, on-prem, uh, wherever you want us to, to do that. Very cool. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you said that about the shirt. I think that was my biggest takeaway from that. The, the platform sounds amazing too, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, please just send me a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Very cool. Now I would like to ask one final question about biggest fuck ups you've seen over the years when it comes to ML. Yes. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we've seen has just been like going in, the, going in and building all the infrastructure and all the platform without a single use case that would move the business. Like mass, like starting from, let's figure out how we're going to do ML models at scale when we don't even have a single ML model that's been proven to move the business forward. Wow. 
Like that, that backward, it, it, and, and we've seen that in some organizations where it's like, you, you know what happens? Then those organizations, the executive, they're just like, Mel's BS, it doesn't work. Uh, like it's not real, right? They get, um, so, you know, that's kind of, so, so that's the biggest one. We've seen it in a couple of very large organizations where we've been like, okay, we're, what's the, you know, and, 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 and it gets tied really together with the concept I call boiling the ocean which is trying to solve everything for scale all at once and for every single use case. So if you start thinking about like, okay, we're going to think about every ML use case that could possibly happen at the organization to start with. And it's like, how about we start with two hmm. and we get those running and we prove to the entire organization that ML will work. And then we move on to something bigger and wider. So uh, chewing off too much or, or starting without a use case are the two biggest fuck ups that we've seen. Wow. That's great insight. And that's something that Charles Martin was on here uh, about a month ago. And he was talking about the need for automation and why sometimes or most of the time it's not even necessary. It's like, just figure out if it works first and then automate it, then figure out all the best totally. ways to do it and make it, you know, this, this top level. But like you say, is there a use case for it? Can we just figure out that it's, there's business value involved behind this and then we can go about polishing it. Yeah. A, a slight devil's advocate comment to that, which is data science ML is the most iterative process in software we've ever seen. Speed of iteration is core and we want to apply kind of like an evolutionary theory to it, which is we want the bad to go out live fast and die quick so that the good can stay. And so, you know, there is something about creating processes for very rapid iteration. Mm. Um, and, 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 very, I, I, and DevOps is kind of the concept of rapid iteration to production. But if you think about it, like ML is way faster in its iteration workflow than anything in the traditional DevOps space. So you have to think about it slightly differently, but you do, you know, you want bad models to go out and get killed fast and the good models to survive. But the only way to get that is through fast iteration. Yeah, yeah, completely. So before we jump off, you said you were really into the integrations. Can you talk to me a bit about what you're integrating with and what you decided to integrate with, why? Yeah, so, so we've decided that our core value prop as an organization is to figure out the deploy, inference, and manage, and that our job is to integrate with every other tool around that. And so what I mean by that is, for example, when you're thinking about source code management, you know, integrating on top of your source code management system, when we think about model development, we want, we integrate with pretty much every single model development tool out there in terms of we can take them out. When we think about data connectivity and data connections, you know, we connect to almost every data tool and ETL tool out there. So for us, it's really, really core to think about, you know, do you want to run hyperparameter optimization against our in production? Then yeah, you can integrate, you know, we have an API first philosophy. And so you can actually go do that. I was just on a call yesterday with a, with a company in the explainability space and they're saying, Hey, you know, we were thinking about, Hey, you know, we're not, you know, explainability is its own thing. We're not, you know, that, that's not something that like, you know, you have to have a lot of specialty on it and it's training and stuff like that. And so we're just going to integrate into their system so that they can actually, you know, uh, you know, rely on that. So that's kind of what I mean about integrations. We think, um, uh, the concept that I, that we use internally is, um, you know, which is, uh, tightly integrated, loosely coupled, meaning you can plug and play components and at any time, but you want them tightly integrated from full automation perspective. And so, and that's how you should design stacks inside companies. And it's not just ML, right? It's just uh -huh. proper software development stacks. Like you, you want that, right? You want to be able to plug and play components as you want. And we've taken the approach that's good for our customers. That's good for the industry. And that's how we approach the problem. And okay. So Richard has a question and I have so many more questions. We're going to have to do a round two with this one, but <laughs> Richard real fast. If you have an extra two minutes, there I, you go. I do. I do. All right, cool. So, uh, he's asking if this product is relevant to small startups with 10 people and only a few data scientists and how would that be? And also I'm throwing a link to our Slack community in the chat. So if anyone wants to continue talking to Diego, he is also in there and you can learn all about MLOps. 
So yeah, so so size of company does not uh, does not it, it really is around like do you have models that are actually going to go in production? So um, if you look at our our SaaS product, like there's no commit. You can just go and deploy your models there and run them and you're paying per inference second, right? And, and so it's like the most flexible. So size doesn't really matter. And we're a secure platform. We can kind of walk through all that. Um, for, you know, what we do is, you know, kind of like the different levels that we have as an organization is like if you need more and more security. So like we deploy in certain environments where there's no internet access. Like literally it's just everything. And so that's kind of how we think about it. Size of the company is not relevant. It's really about, do you have models that need to run in production? If so, then we can help you. Perfect answer. Thank you, Diego, for sharing your time with us. Of course. I am, I feel enlightened on the build versus buy. And I really appreciate you all doing this work to, map out what the journey is like because i think whether or not someone is going to invest in algorithmia it is very useful for anybody who is looking at this so i'm sure everyone feels the same it is something that it you opened some doors in my mind and i'm very happy that we got together and did this I love talking about this stuff i'm really happy that you invited me to this i'd love to talk to any of you who have questions around this uh, about it and, uh, you know, go check out algorithmia.com and, uh, send me some feedback. My email is Diego at algorithmia. I'll send you yeah. a t-shirt. There's the t-shirt. And also you have, I'll be sending a link in a follow-up email to everyone of the, where they can download this report, right? It's, it's on algorithmia.com. Yep. If you want to just go right now and get it. And I'll also send a link with everything that we just talked about uh, as far as the, the data science is boring blog. And I'm just going through the chat here to make sure there was nothing else that we hit on, but perfect. If, if you all want, I'll see you in Slack. Uh, and Diego, thank you again, man. This has been awesome. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Have a great one, everybody.